Hey, welcome along to Soundtrack and Extra, my little companion YouTube show to my podcast, Soundtrack. And we've got three great guests for you today. Um, Ludwig Gorenson on the way, Connor McNeil as well, but first up, Basam Tarek, who is a brilliant filmmaker. His most recent film is called Mogul Mowgli, and he has written it and he directs it, and he co-wrote it with the star of the film, Riz Ahmed. It tells the story of um, Riz's character, Zed, who is a British Pakistani hip hop star, rapper, and he's struck down with a degenerative disease on the eve before a world tour. It's an incredible exploration into identity and place and positioning and all that kind of stuff and it's really powerful it's really emotional it's really really brilliant and um, you can hear a full chat with me with Bassam as part of this week's episode of the podcast along with Ludwig but I really wanted to include him on here just to give you a taste of the show uh, of the film I should say so we've got a trailer for you right now and then I started off by asking Bassam kind of how, how the film came about. What was the kind of seed? What was the starting point? Yeah, I'll ask you where you're from. Now, where are you really from? Britain's from Bourne, had another cup of tea and that. But where my jeans are from, people don't really MC and that. Now, everybody, everywhere, want the country back. If you want me back to where I'm from, the proper need a match. I'll find my own place in this business of Britishness. I'll make my own approach and concept of us. So Riz and I have been friends for a few years. He had seen my first documentary, These Birds Walk, and we wanted to figure out a way to work together. We just yeah. didn't know what it would look like. And uh, I was a fan of his music, but I always knew that he could push it in, in other ways. And, that, and that's what I was actually curious to do was like, how can we actually build a narrative through music and say something that, you know, is also about our own insecurities and, and that the, the I think that, irrelevance that I feel that's always around the corner and um, I think that's what I kind of wanted to talk about but I also realized that coming home was a way to really kind of bring it in really you know bring it home as they say so um, and then I think with the illness it, it was something close to both him and I in our own lives and we felt like that's that's a really strong way to kind of talk about the, sort of these this like cosmic fate that the things that we cannot control sometimes that actually end up deciding what success will look like for us. So the way we started the film, we knew it was gonna start in a concert and it was gonna end with a concert in a bathroom. And that was something that we knew was gonna happen. And the song was gonna be this, this song that he's kind of creating mm -hmm. a, you know, along the way of, of tuba texting. So that was something that I think we, we started building in a little bit more as we were filming. Also having Riz from the start was, was kind of an important part of this where him and I, we were like, you know, every step of the way we were lockstep. We, we were taking, you know, every step together with in the writing and, and how we're building this. And, and that was really important because he had to be full on at every moment of the film where with, with every decision I was making and how we're going to like move Zed forward. I've been such a fan of, of Riz's for so long and I love watching his journey in terms of, you know, where he's kind of, putting himself and and how honest he is with with everything that he does mm. and I think that I wanted to ask about you know those performances because we know that he can do that as Riz Ahmed we know that he's got you know he's he's so many things and being up mm. on stage and 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 rapping is something that he could do you know it's 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 part of what he does so when he's playing the role of someone who is doing that <laughs> what what it, it's kind of it, it's is for you you know being his being his friend and being close to them is is there you know it's, it's I don't even know what the question is but is it kind of you know how much of it is Riz and how much of it is Zed yeah that that's a great question and uh, you know the funny thing is I had seen him live a few times and I filmed him from backstage a few of his Riz uh concerts and I felt like we needed to take the energy to like 12 or 13 with, with Zed. And I think he felt the same way. So we brought on Polly Bennett, who is this incredible uh, choreographer and movement director. She choreographed and she did the movement direction uh, for Rami Malik in uh, Bohemian Rhapsody when he was playing Freddie Mercury. Oh, wow. and, and she's just an exciting person who 
and and I think the, the language of movement is very important for me because I realize that I'm a very self-conscious person when it comes to the body, and I don't know how to necessarily, I don't know how to like I don't know how to perform that way. Like I I, I can get quite intellectual, and I need someone to help break that. So yeah. so she basically choreographed a lot of the movements for Riz to help him and and give him basically some of these tools that he can use. And I think we knew out of the gate we wanted Zed to just have this kind of crazy energy that, that just kind of came out of nowhere, which when you go to uh, one of his, like, you know, back then he went by Riz MC, but now, you know, he just goes by Riz um, in his, as, a, as an artist, performing artist. But, but those, those early Riz MC concerts, I think he's, he can be quiet. Like, and I think that's a really exciting thing about Riz is he's very intellectual. Mm-hmm. And I think, um, and I think that headiness can be quite cool, but, but I think for film and, and because you're not there live with him, it just needs to have a bit more of a flair. So it, it is so much of, of Riz, but it's like, let's go just get a little bit bigger. Let's get that Prince Nassim kind of swagger <laughs> yeah. in this as well. So yeah. I think that was something that we wanted to kind of- And the anger as well. There's just yeah. the anger that's in there as well, totally. Yeah. If you want me back to where I'm from, the property, I'll find my own place in this business of richness. I'll make my own approach of concept of us. My blood and sweat's in us. I hope it's the start of a, or this is the first of many, many mm-hmm. films that you guys make together. Because it's quite clear that you, you, you very much, you know, with with doing what you say of kind of, you know, pushing and and trying to get, you know, get 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 that extra thing. The results are extraordinary. So I look forward to mm-hmm. to seeing what's what's next from you guys. But um, thank you so much for your time and massive oh, yeah. congratulations on the film oh, again. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. And um, yeah, it's lovely to chat to you and meet you. Thank you very much, Hassan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edith. This this really means a lot. Yeah, thank you. Stay safe. Bye. Yeah, bye. Um, Massive thanks to Bassam for taking the time to talk to us from his car too. I don't know if you noticed that. Um, Listen, there's a really lovely in-depth chat with him about this extraordinary film, Mogul Mowgli, up on this week's podcast. This week's podcast is both Bassam and Ludwig Gorenson, the composer, for The Mandalorian, Tenet, Black Panther, amongst many other things. Um, And you can hear them both in full on the podcast and Ludwig, a little clip of Ludwig coming up a little bit later on. But please do go and watch Mogul Mowgli. You can get it on the BFI player or on Curzon Home Cinema. As I said earlier, it was due to have a cinematic release, but um, good old COVID scuppered its chances once again. But Hopefully it means that a lot more people are going to go and see this film. So please do go and watch it because it's absolutely extraordinary. And Riz's performance is knockout. It's so good. Um, so there we go. That is Bassam Tarek. Excited to see what he does next as well. Uh, next we have Connor McNeil, a fantastic Irish um, actor, writer, um, and he works across, you know, TV, film and theatre. He was in The Ferryman, which I absolutely loved. I was lucky enough to go and see that. Um, the Jez Butterworth, Sam Mendes directed um, theatre, huge successful theatre production, which went to Broadway. Anyway, you'll hear him talk about that in, in just a second. But he's in a brand new BBC drama called um, Industry. Now, I've only seen one episode of this and Connor plays a character called Kenny Kildane, who you just see really fleetingly in the first episode. But as we find out, there's lots more to come for the character. Um, I really like the look of this actually it's got from the first episode it seems really interesting it's set in the world of kind of finance you know city boys and girls and it's written by these two guys um mickey down and conrad uh way who were both city boys so it's coming from a really true place which makes it even more terrifying um but here have a quick look at it and see what you think and um and connor to tell us more about it Young people are our capital. Just make yourselves indispensable. Why are you here? I only ever want to be judged on the strength of my abilities. And paid for it. Feels weird to be in a position of power here. What are you going to do with it? No rest for the wicked. Nothing good ever happens past who I am. Everything good happens past who I am. <laughs> Wake up! 
I don't think you should be here. You can't trade your way out of this. It's reckless. We both know what you're capable of. And this is a play for the end. Industry on BBC Two and iPlayer. I think it's it's so incredible because it's an ensemble piece, Edith, that it like jumps around so many different storylines, so many different uh, characters that it keeps you hooked the whole way through. It doesn't stop doing that. Do you know what I mean? And especially yeah. with, you know, I'm Burley in the first episode, my storylines with uh, Marisa Abella, who plays Yasmin, kicks off episode two. And then obviously the huge moment that happens in episode one that no one's expecting and all of those. So there's the, yeah. the very smart and clever boys, Mickey and Conrad. Yeah, so how, I mean, this they're, where, where have they come from? Because their their writing's extraordinary. And it's kind of, you know, in terms of the amount of characters that you are kind of visually aware of in this, that you can see that there's going to be storylines and there's going to be things, you know, kind of developed as the, the series goes on. What's their, you know, what, do you know what, where did where they're, they come from? <laughs> where they, they're both, um, they both worked in City. Both of them were grad students there. They both went through the experience. Okay. On the cast, our young cast are going through. Um, and I think both of them spent different amounts of time there. I don't know if they were working at the same bank at the same time together. That I'm not sure of. I could be wrong there though. But they basically started writing a show about banking as like a something to do on the weekends type thing, I think. And then out of that started writing together, they wrote a feature, which I think won at the London Film Festival maybe a, a few years back. And then they wrote this script and developed it with Bad Wolf, but it's pretty much their first thing, which is absolutely huge. Wow. And they show ran the entire thing, a HBO show, which is massively impressive, but also deservedly so, because they're so smart. They're such clever lads. Like. And then you have like Lena Dunham come in and direct the first episode. It's like... What? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that was class. Was she, it? She, whenever I, I had a, was aware of it, she was already on board. She had just joined and became exact producer and was directing the pilot. Um, and then very quickly, but you know, with these things, like very quickly, once you, you start with that kind of stardom of like working with someone like that, and then very quickly you're in the work and everybody's elbows deep, yeah. you know? So it's like, she's just brilliant people. though. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and she, but she's, she's brilliant, dude. She's like, so she brings out such energy, like every day, her positivity and energy riles everyone up. And yeah. right down to like every crew member, you'll see a smile on their face when Lena's on set, you know, she's kind of brilliant like that. That's amazing to hear. Mm. I'm excited to see what she does as a director, actually. You know, kind of, yeah. she's got, she's just kind of formidable. And with everything that she's kind of thrown her weight to, she's kind of made such an impression, I think, that I'm really excited to see what she does with, with the, her kind of directing eye. Totally. And it's nice to see, isn't it, something? Because I suppose everything she's directed has been her writing, hasn't it? And this yeah. is the first time she's taken a script and done it and smashed it out the park as well. You know, yeah. it's brilliant. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about, what can you tell us about Kenny and, and kind of his, because like you say, we only get a sort of glimpse of him in the first episode. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, what without kind of giving anything away, really, what, what can you tell us about him? Is he's, he one of the nice guys? Because there's a lot of idiots in this. There's a lot of dickheads in this world. He, I think he might be one of the worst. Oh, yeah. What? <laughs> oh, come on. Oh, but that's more fun isn't it, to play. They're the funner parts to play, though, aren't they? When you yeah, it's so much fun, and that's what attracts you to it. It's instantly you're like, oh, this is awful. <laughs> um, he's yeah, he's horrible. He's absolutely horrible, but really interesting. And again, not to keep banging on about the the boys being like brilliant writers, but you 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 meet him the first few apps that you meet him, and you're like, that guy, absolutely not. He's horrible. He's a bully. He's a misogynist. He's um, an idiot, really, to be honest. And then. I think it's like episode five six there's this flip and you go whoa and everything's more complex and messy and complicated and uglier actually in a in a, in a, a way than it initially was and it says more about the systemic situation that is within these institutions yeah his character kind of comes to represent that towards the end that like th these people are sometimes nearly made because of the environments that that they're in not that that makes it okay for him to behave like that and not that he's he's old enough and smart enough and should know better, but this is this is the world he was built in. I think there's a line where he, I think he says, I, I'm just trying to treat you how I was treated. And you're oh, like, wow, that's it, that, you know, and so that's like, 
But yeah, he's he was loads of fun to play, but I don't think he's so much fun to watch. I think people all <laughs> grow to hear him. <laughs> good to say goodbye. Fun to play. Good to yeah. say goodbye to. Hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, I was trying to remember how long ago I was very lucky that I got to come and see the Ferryman. Oh, and, cool! Um, with Laura and um, and you, and I'm trying to think how long ago that was. That's God. We were just texting about this because we spent so two Christmases ago we spent in broad on Broadway doing Christmas on Broadway. Wow, God, that was Broadway. Then London was before that. Then wasn't London it? was before. That's a three three and a half years ago. Wow. And we started it the summer before that, so four years ago when we started rehearsals and stuff. Yes, but that was a long journey. That was it was yeah. amazing. Because I remember I was really lucky that I went to what was I? I was doing something with Paddy, and yeah. I think it was for his film for Journeyman. Yeah, and, yeah. And he was like, "Here, I'm. I'm about to do my first theater thing," and I'm like, I'm, "Is this? I couldn't believe it. it was the first time he'd done, you know, kind of something like that." And he was said he was terrified. He was, he was terrified. So scared, but he was so good at it. And you he, all just—I mean, I loved all this kind of, all this stuff that you know. And he was—he was doing all these like little live things every night before you guys were going on stage. You'd be in the dressing room singing songs <laughs> and all that. And it, but it was like it was—it felt like such a wonderful kind of warm environment that you all had backstage with this, with this cast and with this production. And still, even still, we're like our group WhatsApps nonstop, Maybe. and like do you know, we're all just so. It's really rare that as well. I'm so lucky because we were in that show for so long. Yeah. Can you imagine? <laughs> oh. you know what I mean? And those those West End dressing rooms are tiny. Like there was like three people in the dressing room. Um. Yeah. No. It was. It was. It was ridiculous, and I, it was brilliant. Do you know it was incredible, Edith? You saying that about Paddy being nervous first time. See when we went to Broadway to see him just be like, yes, I know how to do this, and. It was kind of incredible to see that year and mad because like we were all huge Paddy fans to get to work with him was amazing. And then he's like, I've never done this before. Is the mad? It was the maddest thing. He's amazing. Yeah. But yeah. It was kind of. It was. It had a real like traveling carnival feel to it with us all. <laughs> I think. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Um. But yeah, what a, an amazing experience. Such a special, special show and yeah. brilliant, brilliant people. Very funny people as well. Has lockdown been? kind to you in terms of work or have you how have you kind of no, uh, I don't know like everybody else is it is it you know it is what it is yeah. I've done a tiny bit on a film in September which I'm really lucky to have, have been on um myself and Jamie Dornan wrote a script in lockdown which I is heard about really this. Exciting. Very exciting. Um, so we just have we just signed, signed it up with some producers in America at the minute which is all really exciting we're in like the early the I think it's the amazing stage where like anything is possible yeah. and anything can happen with it. So we're in that really exciting stage. And I haven't said that if lockdown hadn't happened, he's so busy. I'm busy. Like we never would have had the time to do that. And we've wanted to do this for so long. Yeah. So in a way it was a blessing in disguise, you know? It sounds so, brilliant. I can't yeah. wait to, to see where it goes. Sounds yeah, I'm really it, yeah. It's right in something that you, you got a real passion for. Cause I know you had a short out a couple of years ago. But yeah. in terms of that side of things, is is writing something that you kind of really like to, to kind of pursue even more. Totally, I I start I started writing from being out of work kind of, and like and I had a story to tell. I wanted to tell it, but it was like that. If you're going to sit doing nothing, you'll go nuts. So do something. Um, and then whenever the because the short got nominated for BAFTA, I ended up having access to that world a little bit more than I necessarily would have. And I've started developing things. And so like I have some TV things in development, a few scripts I'm writing and, and it's trying to get the time and trying to get the focus. But I, I was asked this the other day about it and it's not something I want to do with Phoebe Waller-Bridge is doing. I want to do with Charlie Scambino is doing. Like you should be able to be a creative force or a creative energy. If you can't, I, can't, I, I won't release an album. But like, do you know? <laughs> I, love the, I love the idea of you being the Irish Charlie Scambino. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a gap in the market. This uh, is Ireland. Can we have your version of This is Ireland, please? My rap album. That would be um, amazing. amazing. <laughs> but no, but I do think, and I think that that's the way the younger generation is kind of going yeah, as well. Absolutely. So I do, I do want to do it all. And I'm writing as much as I'm acting and I put as much energy into, into both. Brilliant. Um, listen, I'm really excited to see 
what happens next, you know, in terms of both in front of but and behind the camera as well, in terms of what you're creating. And um, and I'm really looking forward to watching the rest of the series of of industry as well. Really looking forward to Brilliant. that. I'll enjoy yeah. it. Um, Amazing. Edith, thank you so much. My pleasure. Love. It's lovely to chat to you. Lovely to see you. Yeah. See you later. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe see you at Christmas for a drink. Who knows? We can keep everything crossed, we can can't hope. we? We can hope, yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, listen, take care, Connor. It's lovely to chat see to you. See you later. Bye-bye. Ah, oh, always a treat. Conor McNeil there. Uh, his character, Kenny Kilblaine, uh, very much looking forward to seeing where he goes to, or maybe not, in this uh, series of industry. That's up on the iPlayer now, the first episode, and it's kind of coming out weekly on the BBC. So go and check it out. It's really, really worth it as well. I'm very much looking forward to his and Jamie's film. Fingers crossed. Uh, right, next up, our last guest on this week's show, Ludwig Gorenson. Now, I had him on the soundtrack and podcast back in September, talking about his work on Tenet, and we kind of touched on the music of Mandalorian back then, and I'm so grateful and glad to get the chance to have him back and to really dive deep into the soundtrack for Mandalorian. Now, I've only got a little clip for you right now of us talking about that, but um, if you want to hear more, and there's a full-length chat with him, on this week's podcast episodes. You have Ludwig and Bassam on this week's episode of the podcast, episode 220. So please do go and check that out. But in the meantime, here's Ludwig. And, you know, we talk about, um, the I guess, the influences for this, this brilliant score. And most of you, if you're fans of it, will know that he wrote it on, he started anyway, writing it on the recorder, this big kind of treble recorder that... Anyway... Here is the brilliant Ludwig Gordonson. Uh, I'm going to start off by talking about, you know, how you start a score for something like The Mandalorian and those conversations you have with John Favreau about influences and inspiration and what he's looking for. When he was visualising it and writing it, did he did he have any sort of playlists or specific music that he was listening to that he talked to you about that were, you know, reference points at all? Yeah, the first reference he gave me was uh, the Kurosawa movies, Seven Samurais. And so that was, I mean, I went back and listened to that score the first thing I did. Mm -hmm. And also, obviously, uh, the Western is a big influence in the show, the Western theme. And, yeah. and um, you know, I love all those, I mean, all the Murakami scores are um, iconic. Um, and so those were kind of the two reference points uh, for him, like samurai films and Westerns. safety deemed such destruction. You must reunite it with its own kind. Where? This you must determine. The songs of eons past tell of battles between Mandalore the Great and an order of sorcerers called Jedi. You expect me to search the galaxy and deliver this creature to a race of enemy sorcerers? This is the way. You know this is no place for a child. Wherever I go, he goes. So I've heard. What do you think about buying that kind of kit of recorders? What was the, um, what was the stimulus for going? I'm going to get some recorders. 
Uh, for me, it was trying to uh, reconnect with uh, my the inner my inner child. Uh, I was I was I was thinking about Star Wars and Star Wars music and thinking about how it felt when I heard that music for the first time. Yeah. And I remember when I was like eight and nine and I heard the music for the first time and it felt like I was on a different planet in a different universe. And uh, I and, and I wanted to co- reconnect with that feeling and uh, take a step because now almost now every time I write music I sit in front of the computer mm-hmm. and you know you sit and work in front of the computer type in on the keyboard you play on the keyboard and you look at a screen you know you put so much of your time and energy into it but it, it, you don't get anything back you know it's not talking to you um, so I wanted to just surround myself with instruments that I could physically play and uh, that was vibrating they, they were talking back to me that told me to gave me different ideas and because that's the way I used to write music when I was a, when I was a kid mm. and also so maybe it's in my unconscious maybe it's somewhere in the back of my mind I was like well what about recorders that was like the first instrument you played so <laughs> I, I ordered a set of uh, recorders and I, I, I'd, I'd never seen that bass recorder before. So I, that's what I was just drawn to from the, from the beginning. And it was just really incredible therapeutic for me to just sit in a room and play that instrument for two days and just kind of meditate and just play that, mm. these kind of intervals. I was probably driving my engineer nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I was like literally saying, because I, I couldn't really, technically I can't really play a lot of notes, I, but I rhythmically, I'm like, yeah, I can play rhythms pretty pretty well. So it was like all like, you know, very, very yeah. rhythmically it's a recorder of music that came out for two days. Ludwig Gordonson, if you want to hear that chat in full uh, with loads of lovely, great bits of music in there, head to this week's podcast and yeah, and you can hear more up there. What a lovely show and lovely to be able to enthuse about some brilliant stuff that's out there at the minute. Bassam and his film Mogul Mowgli, which as I said, had to be a five player or Curzon Home Cinema um, for more details or the website mogulmowgli.co.uk. Um, check out Connor in Industry and Ludwig, The Mandalorian is up on Disney Plus as we speak. And many thanks to all three for their time for Soundtrack and Extra this week and to you for watching. Please do subscribe, uh, tell your friends and yes, spread the word. Take care and we'll see you next time.